Page 14. The Strangest Man, The Hidden Life of Paul Dirac, Mystic of the Atom, by Graham Farmello, 2009. Chapter 1. Part 3. In these classes, Dirac learned to make idealized visualizations of various manufactured products by showing them from three orthogonal points of view, making no allowance for the distortions of perspective. Britain was among the slowest of the wealthier European countries to introduce technical drawing into its schools and did so only in the wake of the Great Exhibition in 1851. Although the exhibition was a great popular success, the most perceptive of its 6.2 million visitors saw evidence that mass technical education in Britain would have to improve substantially if the country were to retain its economic hegemony against growing competition from the US and Germany. The government agreed, enabling the Great Exhibition's prime mover Sir Henry King Cole to change the technical curriculum of English schools so that boys were taught technical drawing and given an appreciation of the beauty of manufactured objects as well as natural forms. There was, however, a backlash to this practical notion of beauty in the form of the aesthetic movement, which flourished in England from the mid-1850s. The movement's leader in France was the flamboyant poet and critic Th. Atilde Copyright of Fall Gautier, a weight-lifting habit to Atilde Copyright of the Louvre's Greek galleries. His phrase Art for Art's sake became the motto of the English aesthetes, including Oscar Wilde, who shared Gautier's belief that formal, aesthetic beauty is the sole purpose of a work of art. This view would later be distantly echoed in Dirac's philosophy of science. Sir Henry Cole's reforms endured, the guidelines set out by him and his associates were being used in Bishop Rhodes School when Iraq began his formal schooling. In 1909, the educationalist F. H. Hayward summarized the prevailing philosophy that underlies the contemporary teaching of art, drawing aims at truth of conception and expression love of beauty, facility in invention, and training in dexterity, nature study and science lessons cannot proceed far without it. Hayward urged that students should practice their drawing skills by trying to represent accurately both natural and manufactured objects, including flowers, insects, tables, garden sheds and pen knives. In autumn 1912, Dirac was asked to draw a pen knife, and he did it competently enough. Like all his other drawings, it includes not a line of embellishment. The school took pains to teach its pupils how to write legibly, according to textbook rules that Dirac and his brother apparently studied closely. They developed a similar style of handwriting, consistent with the rules set out in the books they studied neat, easy to read and virtually devoid of flourishes, except for the unusual forming of D, with a characteristic curl at the top left. Dirac did not change this calligraphy one iota for the rest of his life. In the early summer of 1911, school inspectors noted that the boys who are particularly bright and responsive are being carefully trained in habits of self-reliance and industry. Nearly three years later, when Dirac was in his final year at the school, the inspectors visited Bishop Rhode again and wrote warmly of this progressive school and the practical education it offered. A keen vigorous and thoughtful head, teacher. Staff are earnest, painstaking. Drawing is well taught and handwork is resourceful, the boys make a number of useful models and are allowed considerable freedom in their choice while the work is so taken as to train them in habits of self-reliance, observation and careful calculation and measurement. Bishop Road School wanted to give its pupils the stalls they needed to get good jobs. but. For Dirac, the most important consequence of this practical approach was that it helped to shape his thinking about how the universe works. As he was sitting at his desk in his tiny Bristol classroom, producing an image of a simple wooden object, he had to think geometrically about the relationships between the points and lines that lie in a flat plane. In his mathematics classes, he also learned about this type of Euclidean geometry, named after the ancient Greek mathematician who reputedly discovered it. So, Dirac studied geometry using both visual images and abstract mathematical symbols. 
within a decade, he would transfer this geometric approach from concrete technological applications to the abstractions of theoretical physics from an idealized, visual representation of a wooden fountain pen stand to an idealized, mathematical description of the atom. Later in life, Dirac would say that he never had a childhood. He knew nothing of the rites of passage of most other young boys long weekend afternoons spent stealing eggs from birds' nests, scrumping from nearby orchards, dashing out in front of trams. In many ways, as a child he seems to have behaved much as Newton would done. A sober, silent, thinking lad, never was known scarce to play with the boys abroad was how one of Newton's friends described him the description applies equally well to Dirac as an infant. Dirac was not interested in sport, with the exception of ice skating, which he learned with Betty and Felix at the nearby Coliseum Ring, the talk of Bristol when it opened in 1910. Decades later, his mother recalled that he would sit quietly, reading books that he had placed neatly around him and learning long poems that he would recite to his family. She shed some light on his sheltered child. Hood when she spoke to reporters in 1933, his father's motto has always been to work, 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 and if the boy had showed any other tendencies, then they would have been stifled. But that was not necessary. The boy was not interested in anything else. There is little doubt that Charles Dirac impressed his sedulous work ethic on his younger son, who later wrote admiringly of his father's conscientiousness. One day while cycling, to school, my father fell off his bike, trying to avoid a child who ran out in front of him, and broke his arm. He was very conscientious, so he continued through the school and continued with his teaching, in spite of the broken arm. Eventually, the headmaster found out about it and sent him home, and told him not to come back until he was better. Paul was also aware that his father was exceptionally careful with money. In April 1913, Charles took the biggest financial decision of his life by purchasing a more expansive and more spacious home. The family moved from the cramped terrace of Monk Road to a neat semi-detached residence a few minutes walk away in a slightly more salubrious part of Bristol, at 6 Julius Road. The Dirac's now had a home befitting Charles's status in the community, with separate rooms for their two boys so that Dirac now had a place to escape, a private place where he could work alone. The family still kept themselves to themselves, inviting no visitors into their home, apart from Flo's family, her guests all female at a monthly afternoon tea party and a steady stream of pupils who took private language lessons from her husband. Like many parents, Charles entered all his children for scholarship exams. When Felix was nine years old, he failed one of these exams, leading his father to demand an explanation from his teachers but he also failed the exam a few years later. Paul had no such problems, he passed every scholarship exam with flying colors and, thus, unlike Felix and Betty, ensured he was educated at minimal expense to his parents. Dirac could see new technology making its imprint on Bristol. The city centre was a patchwork of centuries-old buildings and brand new ones, many of them emblazoned with advertisements for new services and products. Open-topped motor cars vied for space on the roads with horse-drawn carriages, bone-shaking bicycles and the trams that made their jerky way round the city. When the programmes of road construction began, in the early years of the century, cars began to dominate the city. In late 1910, Dirac had witnessed the beginnings of the Bristol aviation industry, one of the first and largest in Britain. The leading figure in this new Bristol industry was the local entrepreneur Sir George White, who founded the British and Colonial Aeroplane Company and supervised the building of some of the earliest aircraft in a tram shed in Filton, a few miles north of the Dirac's home. Long afterwards, Dirac told his children that he would rush out into the back garden to see aeroplanes precariously taking off from the new airfield less than a mile away. It seems that he wanted to find out more about this new technology. Among the papers he kept from his youth were details of a program at a local technical college, 
beginning in December 1917, 10 educational lectures on aeronautics. Dirac and his brother stood out among the boys in Bishopston as they both spoke good French even before they started school. According to one report, local boys would stop the Dirac brothers on the streets and ask them to speak a few sentences of French. This knowledge of French was also obvious to the students at their next school, where the language was taught by the school's most feared disciplinary and their father. End of chapter 1 Page 19